the Buddha once said that he taught only one thing, suffering and the end of suffering. Sounds like two things. But he taught about suffering specifically to put an end to it, which is what makes it all one. And so it's important to remember that every time we meditate. That's the one thing we're focusing on, putting an end to suffering. All the teachings, all the techniques, all the practices aim in that direction. And they're meant to be used for that purpose. So no matter how abstract a teaching may seem, it finds its place in the teaching, in the way it either gives an understanding of suffering or it leads to the end of suffering. And again, the understanding of the suffering is specifically for that purpose, putting the end to it, putting an end to it. So whether there's a doctrine of karma, the Four Noble Truths, Tibetan and co-arising, emptiness, these are all aimed at putting an end to suffering. And where does suffering happen? It happens right here in our own minds. So if a teaching applies to what we're doing right here in our own mind, fine, that's, that's the Dharma at that point. If a particular teaching doesn't apply, you put it aside. It's not what you need at that particular time. But when you put it aside, don't throw it away. Have it there handy for whenever you need it. Like the teaching on karma. The Buddha said basically that our experience of the present moment is caused by two things, factors from the past and factors from the present moment, and particularly our intentions. Past intentions, present intentions, and the result of the two. The past intention itself is gone, so all we experience now are the results of those past intentions. And then we've got the current intention and the results of that current intention. It sounds pretty abstract, and it can be seen that way. But it also has a very immediate practical application. When things come into your mind, you're focusing on the breath, and yet other things come in. Remind yourself the important thing is not whether or not they come in, it's how you react. There are going to be things coming in. The mind is designed to churn up thoughts. We've been training it in that direction ever since we first learned how to speak. And so it's natural that these thoughts are going to come floating through. Well, the problem is not whether or not they're going to come floating through, it's whether you try to catch hold of them. They may come in and they seem to be so unfinished, and you have a compulsion to finish the thought, tie it up neatly before you send it packing. Well, that in and of itself becomes present karma, and that pulls you away from the breath. No matter what the thought, no matter what the emotion, just leave it as it is, unfinished. As we were saying last night, the whole nature of the world is that no matter how you tie things up, they're always unfinished. So for the purpose of the meditation, just leave them alone. That's one of the techniques the Buddha recommended for dealing with distraction, distracting thoughts, is just to ignore them. They're there, you don't have to get involved. Even if you get involved to the point of trying to drive them away, they've got you. It's like a crazy person coming and talking to you. You've got work to do, and if you try to turn to the crazy person to drive him away, he's got you. Then you get involved in whatever the discussion is that he's trying to pull you away. Your work gets abandoned. The way to treat a crazy person is to ignore him. He comes up and he'll say all kinds of outrageous things to get your attention, but you just act as, like, as if he's not there. You know he's there, but you don't have to get involved. After a while, go away. Or you can think of it as a beggar coming to get something out of you. Again, if you pay attention to the beggar, even enough to drive the beggar away, you start feeling guilty and the beggar can start preying on your feelings of guilt. But if you 
pretend that he's not there, after a while he goes away. The important thing is what you're doing right now. You're not responsible right now for everything that comes into your mind. You just lay claim to one little corner. Be humble. Admit the fact you're not in charge of everything. You can't control everything in the mind, but you do have this one little corner where you do have some control, where you're focused on the breath. Start out small. And after a while, once, after a while once that spot where you are focused on the breath gets established, then it can start to grow. In the beginning, it's a struggle just to stay on with that one little spot. But once it starts getting comfortable, it gets easier and easier to stay with it. And again, you don't have to feel compelled that you've got to get the best possible breath. Don't turn it into a chore. Make it something you enjoy. You're here to play with a meditation. That was one of John Fung's instructions that always sounded the strangest. He said, play with a meditation. Not in a desultory way, but enjoy it. Think of all the different crazy ways you can breathe right now. It's like getting a new stereo. You turn up the treble, you turn up the bass. Not because you seriously want to hear your music all treble or all bass, but it's just fun to see what you can do with a machine. And after you've explored the, some of the extremes, then you start fine-tuning it to get it to the point where it sounds just right. The important thing is that the breath not become a chore. Because breathing becomes a chore. It just makes life that much heavier. But the breath can be something you enjoy playing with. It can become your, it can become your sport. Then you have something to play with all the time. And at the same time, you start learning more and more about this process of karma, exactly how what you do right now really does shape your experience. You're not a slave to past experiences. Many times we think of the teaching on karma as something deterministic or fatalistic. I've got to suffer because of my past karma, or this had to happen because of past karma. That puts your whole life out of your control. But when you start playing with the breath, you begin to realize that a lot of the shape of your present experience is something you do right now. You improvise it. You cook it up fresh every moment. That puts the element of freedom in your life. And what we're doing as we meditate is to explore this freedom we have right here in the present moment, to see how far it goes. And as the Buddha said, when you explore this area, that's when you start learning how to put an end to suffering. That's the best use of your freedom. So every time you breathe in, breathe out, you have the you have that opportunity to stay with the breath, to maintain your concentration. And if you find that anything disturbs it, you can drop it. This is how the Buddha teaches applies the teaching on emptiness. Many times we hear of emptiness as being something very abstract, very metaphysical. But in the Pali Canon it's pretty straightforward. You look at what's there in the mind to see exactly how much disturbance there still is. When there, wherever there's a disturbance to the peace of mind, okay, there's, there's going to be suffering right there if you latch on to it, if you lay claim to it. So instead you focus on the area where it's not disturbed. Because you begin to realize the disturbance doesn't have to fill your whole range of awareness. There may be a thought chattering away in the back of your mind, but you don't have to pull it in and make it fill your whole mind. It can be just there in the back of the mind. You know that it's there. You don't deny that it's there. You admit its presence, but then you learn to work around it. 
learn to see which tendencies you have in the mind that are going to latch on to it, and just let them go, let them go, let them go. And this technique not only helps you get into a good state of concentration, but once you're there you begin to realize that your concentration is composed of many different elements. And after a while, when some of the elements start seeming unnecessary and they become disturbances. The Buddha talks about directed thought and evaluation. You direct your thoughts to the breath and you evaluate the breath. And you keep working with the breath until you've done just about what you can with the breath. You begin to notice as you do this what factors make a breath uncomfortable. Sometimes they're physical factors, sometimes they're mental factors. If you're too anxious or too much of in a hurry to get things straightened out in the breath, that forces it too much. So it's not so much the physical process of breathing that's the problem, it's your, the attitude of the mind. In fact, what John Lee says at one point, when you're really skillful, you find that you can feel comfortable with any kind of breath. Which shows, again, that it's less and less the, the physical side of the breathing, it's more the mental side. Your attitude towards the breathing, how you can learn how to fit in with almost any kind of breathing. This is how you learn from that element of play in the meditation. But after all, you've got the breath and the mind in tune enough, balanced enough, so that you no longer have to keep Remind yourself to direct the, your thinking to the breath. You no longer have to evaluate the breath. And John Furing's analogy is of a jar of water. In Thailand, they have these huge water jars that they put at drain spouts, their way of collecting rainwater. And he says there comes a point where your jar is full, and no matter how much more water you put into the jar, the jar can only stay that full. In other words, the breath energy in the body has been worked at. You've adjusted it. feels good throughout the body. You get to a point where you just really can't do anything more with the breath. Any fiddling around will just get in the way. So at that point, you can drop the directed thought and the evaluation because they are now disturbances. They got you into the meditation be to begin with. But once you're firmly established there, then you can put them aside as a disturbance. Because they are disturbance, you just drop them and focus in on that sensation of the breath directly, letting it fill your entire awareness. This is how the Buddha has you apply the teaching on emptiness. Again, it's there for the purpose of putting an end to suffering. You don't have to worry about whether things are empty of self-nature or own nature. You just see, okay, is there a disturbance here in my mind right now? If there is, you note it. But you don't focus on it. You don't make that the, the whole of your awareness. It's just that much disturbance. You don't have to add any more disturbance on top of it. You see what's there. You admit what's there, but you don't add anything to it. And that way the teaching on emptiness becomes a tool for coming to the end of suffering. So when you remember the purpose of the teachings, which is to Gain enough understanding of suffering so you can put an end to suffering. Then you look at each teaching that comes your way to see how it can be used in that direction, to see if it's appropriate for what your problem in the meditation is, what your problems in the practice are right now. If it doesn't seem to apply, put it aside for the time being. If it does, put it to use. And don't forget that you've got all these tools. That's what all those teachings in the, the Pali Canon are about over there, all those books we have in the bookshelves. Therefore, this awareness right here, right now, getting ri teaching you how to get rid of the suffering that's right here, right now, the sense of burdensomeness, the sense of stress, however you want to translate dukkha. So you don't have to carry them around on your shoulders to weigh yourself down. But you don't throw them away either. They have their uses. So when you read about them, think about what the use would be. 
when you're meditating, if an issue comes up in your meditation, try to think about what the different teachings have taught you. That might help in dealing with a particular problem you've got right here, right now. That way you take a balanced attitude towards what you've led, read, what you've learned. Not weighing yourself down with it, but not, not trashing it. Having it as tools in your tool, toolboxes. So the mind does become lighter and lighter as you practice. And your understanding of what's going on right here in the present moment becomes clearer and clearer. Those two things go together. The more the understanding, the lighter the practice. As the Buddha said, learning about suffering and putting an end to suffering are one thing. And you see their oneness right here. <clears throat> 